the restorative process. Um, what is that? I'll ask that question. Um, because I know that I, I don't know your story completely. I know his. I heard his today. And um, I, I was appalled and in shock personally by what the church and church government, church leadership calls the process of restoration. Uh, I just want you guys input, take, answer, response. Uh, just let it all come out. Who wants Beyond to that we're not even close. Um, to say that is laid out in the New Testament, a plan uh, for restoration is really not, it's really not there other than Galatians, which we all could, could quote. If yeah. a brother is caught in a sin or a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness is really the, the connotation in the Greek language. Lest you yourself be tempted with the same situation. So you handle it like it, this could be you. Which I know in his case, in my case, and I'm not sure about Warren's, it wasn't that gentle. <laughs> that gentle. It was. It was very. It, it was, was very harsh, abrupt. Harsh, was, brutal, and corrupt. It was hellish. Yeah. Yeah. It was hellacious. Um, so, I, I think the the plan is there in Galatians chapter six to a certain degree, but he's talking about a man. If a man, so he does. It's not a. It's not some stereotypical situation. So theoretically, you could say because of these events, this person has to be restored along these lines. It's not there. Here's what is there. The prodigal son left home and he took all his stuff and lost it all. And the father was on the porch and he came to himself and he said, if I get to my father's house, I'll ask him to be a slave because that is the bend in all men. Because we feel like we disqualified ourselves, we lowered our level of, exist, of existence, of being. So he's already there. I'm a slave. I'll ask him to let me be a servant in his house. But when he got back, the father saw him. And what did the father do? Embraced Ran him. to him and embraced him. Put the ring on his finger. He received stuff he never had before he left. Well, but, but developed the older brother. Well, the, other, the older brother is the religious people. So he was mad at the father for embracing him. Yeah, yeah. Which and it's, is, re it's really not the story of the, the prodigal son. That yeah. every, it's, it's the story of the loving father. Right. Yeah. Because when you see how the father handled the elder brother, he handled him with such genuine love just like he did the prodigal son. But the point I was making, and you can caveat, but the, the point I was making was this, that the prodigal would have never seen what he saw in enjoyment until he lost everything he had. But it's opposite in church. Yeah. We lose and then we lose. Yeah, and it's because the, what we think is the church isn't the church. Right. The, the, the Jesus leaving the 99 and going for the one. Jesus searching for the pearl of great price. Jesus going for the lost coin. All of that indicates the way God searches out people. Even the Adam and Eve story. Adam and Eve sinned. They were hiding and God came looking for them. On, Adam, God. Eve, where are you? He always searches out people. And we haven't talked about it, but my guess is with every one of us on the platform, Jesus was closer to you in the midst of your despair oh, yeah. than he's oh, yeah. ever been in the midst of the platform. Yeah. Okay, so while the lights are on, it's different than in the dark basement. If you have biblical grace, you are numbered with the transgressor. And so if your ministry is based on a good reputation and on, on uh, those th worldly things, attendance, money, uh, and you're an expert at damage control and image management and your films are perfect and your advertisements are perfect and your glasses are clean all the time, okay? If, if that is what you do for a living, then when someone else sends, that gives you opportunity for power because you've got moral superiority. So, so it gives you power so you can market the fact that you were kind to them, but you want them never to resurrect because their fall increases your power. 
See, and so you can market. I, I was on the team. Like, we have some major leaders in the body of Christ right now that, that lie talking about how they understand restoration, but they've never restored anybody. And there are hundreds of, of ministers that have needed them to restore them, and they've actually made sure they never are restored. Well, that's the spirit of meekness okay, you were now, just talking let, about. Let me give you a number here before, you, before we get going with the spirit of meekness, because this is going to be awesome. Okay? 1,000, all of you have read the numbers, 1,500 pastors leave the ministry every month. Okay, and we know that, and we all go, oh, that's sad. That's not the sad part. The rest of that study showed half of them, 750 of them, never even go back to attend church. Ooh. Why? It's because they know it's fraud. Mm -hmm. huh? yeah. Okay, and so, so, now I promise you, I promise you, it's just like every fallen minister, every fallen min leader, they've repented a million times. They've cried tears trying to fix it. They, they've sought God. They've fasted. Before my scandal, I used to get up in the middle of the night, go to my auditorium. It seats 9,000 people. And I'd pace back and forth in there in the middle of the night. And, and we'd fill it twice on Sundays. And I would say, Lord, do anything to clean me up. Specifically thinking of my wife, my kids, these auditoriums, the lights, all that stuff. Okay? Because I would rather have the Holy Spirit really have His way in me than anything this world has to offer. Mm. I am not persuaded by the beaches, the money, the airplanes, the suits, none of that. Well, as I said earlier, I was raised on a pig farm, so I'm just grateful to be out of there. All right, so, so I, I want to be cleaned up. Every single guy I've ever seen that's fallen fell as an answer to their prayers because they were praying, Lord, Lord, heal this. Lord, strengthen this. Father, correct this. Oh, Lord, I want you well. However, I know loads of them that have never been through a scandal, and they are nothing but hirelings. If the money's right, they'll come to the conference. If the, if the advertisement's right, they'll show up. If somebody's there to open their door and get them the right kind of water, they'll be there. If somebody's there and the, the introduction's right and the videos are right and the security team's right and everything's right. And I'm telling you guys, that's fraud. It's fraud in the storehouse. Right. And what we need are more scandals. Wow. Because, because we're in a place, we're in a place now where the, where the rich and famous, the great leaders, their daughters are getting pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. All right? But they're not standing up saying, Jesus has been faithful to my family during a time of horrible pain. They just slip her onto the private jet, fly her away, and they take care of that, and nobody ever knows. That's right. True. And see, I didn't find out about it until I was going through my scandal. We had a guy who's one of the world's leaders in prayer. He came and he saw me quietly in a hotel restaurant. We, it was the visitation of Nicodemus. Okay. So he told me, he told me about a horrible, horrible thing that was going on in their family. And he described his wife, who's a global leader in the prayer movement, as well as he is, being in a foreign country, speaking to 30 or 40,000 people, and he said, oh, Brother Ted, he said, it was terrible. She just about slipped and told about and mentioned the daughter. And I said, well, why didn't she? And he said, are you kidding? Our ministry would be over. Wow. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it have been wonderful if Billy Graham during his prime could have stood up and said, I want you all to pray for me. We're having a terrible time with Franklin right now. And I know that in the midst of our struggle, Jesus will be faithful, but it's just a tough time for me and Ruth right now. Evangelicalism would be different. Or if, if Pat Robertson would have said, my daughter's doing this and this, and my son's doing this, and it's like everything's out of control, but I know God will be faithful. But see, none of them did that. That whole generation, what they did was they maintained Jesus will always be faithful to you, my brother. Victory's on the way. If you'll give $1,000, God will multiply it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and I can guarantee you the anointing is for you. All right. And as, 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 they, as, as we pitched that so strong, our, our own hearts were broken. 
Some of our greatest leaders, they haven't lived with their wives in 35 years until they get to the TV set. All right? And so, so we've always had the crisis. We just never got the resurrection out of it. It's because and we take meekness, we mistake meekness for weakness. The Word That's of God exactly says, right. exactly restore right. such a one in the spirit of meekness. And meekness meaning this, to continue on despite insult, injury, or what comes at you. So when somebody else falls and I take it as an offense and it's a slap at me or it hurts because of what happened, I take it as an offense rather than in a spirit of meekness that I continue on with that brother despite that if we would follow that, we'd see immediate restoration for those people because what they did doesn't change the course of what I'm supposed to do. Wow. Right. They doing something doesn't mean I'm supposed to act different. God set me in a direction and I'm supposed to walk that direction regardless of what you do. In fact, it even makes me more, as you just said. Obviously, my response is supposed to be this. So even though that might have hurt, psh, the spirit of meekness says, I will continue on with you just as I was set. The spirit of meekness, considering yourself less you Listen, also be tempted. every firefighter knows it. Every ambulance worker knows it. And every medic in the Army or the Navy or the Marines or any of them know it. When a guy gets shot, the he, medic, the guy runs up. The fellow that's been shot never lays there patiently and says, oh, thank you so much. I just thank you so much for helping me. They never do that. They'll fight you. They slap you. They run. They'll do anything they can. And because the guy that's just been shot is never cooperative. And so the first thing they have to do is arrest them. And they stop them. And then they save their life. Okay? Now, here's what's interesting about it. So they are under fire now because they're rescuing the guy who's just been shot. And they're going to take whatever abuse it takes to rescue him. How often do you hear, well, we couldn't rescue brother so-and-so because he just wasn't repentant. <laughs> Listen, when a guy's in trauma, yeah, that's, right. that's, that's a fundamental misunderstanding and a fundamental misunderstanding of meekness. Well, meekness means you go in and you wash their feet no matter what they say. You're a yeah. Christian no matter what people do. Jesus is our Lord, not the Internet, not ABC News. Not the local reporter. Right. Jesus is the one that determines what we do. I'll tell you, even in some things regarding the two of both of you, as I, I knew of you, didn't really know you, and I knew yeah. Pastor Rick, and people telling me my, what my response was supposed to be, they gave me this. They gave me the Matthew 18 principle. They said, you know, it's just Matthew 18. You go to your brother. If it doesn't line back up with what you say, then you go to somebody else. Doesn't do that, you go to the church. And, and then if that doesn't work, then you treat him as an unbeliever. <sighs> and my response was, well, what are we doing on believers? We Training love like them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we in the church have gone another route. We say we treat them as unbelievers. We, 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 we cast them out. Yeah. And that's the thing we've got wrong on this theologically. Right. If I'm doing Matthew 18, by the end of the run, if it doesn't line up exactly as what I'm thinking... Whether or not my thinking's right, I'm supposed to treat them as an unbeliever, which means I love them. I'm willing to take the shirt off my back and hand it to them so that they know the true love of where I'm coming from so they can be transformed. That's awesome. And that's the answer that we, we miss Matthew 18. We screw it up thinking, well, I'll treat them as an unbeliever. I don't fellowship with them anymore. Yeah, but here's where that comes from. Okay, what is the church? Okay, is the church the gathering together of the self-righteous? And if we are, then we should kick them out because we're better than they are. Or are we the gathering together of the gratefully redeemed? The resurrected. Yeah. If we are the gathering together of the gratefully redeemed, we are a believer's meeting. So what is a believer? A believer is a person who recognizes that Christ and Christ alone is our righteousness. And that he is progressively working in every one of us so that when we see him face to face, that will be a joyous, perfecting moment. All right? But until we see him face to face, there's a process that's going to go on in every one of us. Not to excuse or justify sin, 
But to simply say, we're living in a world where there are going to be compromises and failures and pain and suffering and mistakes and agony. Mm -hmm. All right? So that's what Jesus died for. The purpose of the cross is not to make you perfect right now in actuality in every way. That's why Jesus died on the cross. It's because you're not perfect. Have you right. heard? Right. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. All right. So, so once you accept the fact I'm not perfect, then all of a sudden Jesus is wonderful and all of a sudden our lives clean up more rapidly. But if we get arrogant and we start saying, you know, brother, you just haven't adequately repented. Come on, you're right. And you're not submitted right. the way you should be. And so I just don't think you should fellowship here anymore. You, 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 you brother, we're turning you over to the devil. <laughs> Gee whiz, what New Testament are they reading? Okay, uh, even when Paul said that, when Paul, when, even when Paul said that, it was about, that's 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, it was about an unrepentant brother that was seducing people in the church and so he said, he, essentially what he was saying, he wasn't saying curse them. He was saying, essentially, leave them to their own means. Mm -hmm. Let the natural product of what they're doing produce itself. But he is not a gratefully redeemed person. It would be like somebody wanting to come to church and saying, uh, look, I, I'm a murderer and I was born a murderer and I really like murdering people. And you just need to accept me the way I am because I was born this way. I enjoy it. And so just please don't make me hate you or I may enjoy you. <laughs> okay? All right. So we wouldn't, because we, we would say, no, to be a believer means that you're struggling with your old sin nature. So if you're a murderer in your heart, you need to at least work against being a murderer and work toward being full of love and grace. Is that true? So actually, the evidence of a born-again believer is a continual struggle against the world, against sin, against our old sin nature. Okay, so, so in 1 Corinthians 5, he's saying, he's saying this person has accepted their sin rather than fought against it. You've accepted him, and that's got to go. But then in 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, it says there's been enough pain. Bring him back. So the grief does not go so deep in him that he would be permanently wounded. Wow. I've decided that when I meet with somebody that's in their, in their, when they are having their great sadness, when they're in the depth of darkness, I'm going to lighten their load. I'm not going to be an expert in their sin. I am not going to be an arrogant, snobbish, pharisaical instrument of Satan. I instead am going to say, the sun will eventually come up for you. It may be two years. It may be one week. It may be five years. But the sun will come up if you will survive. So don't kill yourself. Yeah, that's right. Don't die. Right. Don't abandon everything. Uh -huh. Right. And, and, and. I never tell him this because a guy who's been in despair, as you know, has a hard time trusting. Yes. All right. And that's okay. I don't think they should rush. But when you're in your great sadness, you become a trustworthy person. Yeah. Because nothing superficial yeah. can persuade you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In other words, let me say this graphically and edit this out. Your BS meter goes way up. Uh -huh. Don't edit that. No, and, and, and you can spot it. You can spot it when it's going on. Yeah. And you just don't want to buy it. Yeah. Okay. I, I know that you, you walk through a lot of the same. Yeah. I w the, in practical application, what happens with guys like us is the moment something goes down, you, the immediate response from those that you are accountable to is to suspend you. You're ex either suspended or expelled, depending on the degree of what you've participated in which neither one of those things makes sense biblically because look at King David. When he did what he did, he did not cease to be King David. And God never took his kingdom from him. As a matter of fact, the distinction between David's kingdom and Saul's kingdom was David's kingdom lasts forever because it's built according to Isaiah 55.3 on the sure mercies 
of God, which means mercy is the key ingredient for the endurance of his kingdom. Because mercy was at the, at the root of everything David did. So when David fell, he expected mercy because he believed he, that the core of David was mercy. He showed mercy by not killing Shimei for throwing dirt on him. He could have killed him. And the guy said, let me kill him. He said, no, don't kill him. That, all that happens later. Let him throw the dirt because it's a good time to receive yeah. dirt right now. Right. And you've got to know when that time is. But the point, the point is Saul's kingdom, the distinction is Saul's kingdom was torn. This is what the Hebrew uh, terminology is, was torn, ripped from him. We don't know of any sin Saul committed. Uh-huh. We know he's right. arrogant. As a matter of fact, we know when the Spirit came on, he prophesied like prophets. But he was King Saul. But his kingdom was torn. Why was it torn? Because in the middle, being compelled by a crisis situation, he switched offices. He was a king. And the crisis hit. He saw people leaving. And he started acting like a priest. And God said, now your kingdom is torn from you. Because you acted like something I didn't create you to be. And what we have seen in this day and hour is much tearing. There's a lot of tearing. And it should not be so. And it is because we have not built on the foundation of mercy. Right. Mercy endures forever. Yeah, and let's work on defining It's new that. every morning. Mercy means you get good things you don't deserve. Exactly. Right? Grace means you don't get the consequences that you deserve. That's exactly okay. right. And so, okay, now, a couple big things here. One, we're not accountable to anybody. And there's no reason to build those structures. They're worldly. They're devilish. They don't work. If accountability works, our prisons would be Sunday school classes. Right. Okay? We are accountable for one another. Yeah. We are not accountable to, to one, one another. another. So I'm accountable for you. I'm accountable for you. I'm accountable for you. That means I wash your feet. If but if I, you it, build an accountable to system, right. it turns into a power play and externally imposed morality is not morality. That's great. All right. Say that last sentence again and then I'll Externally caveat. Externally imposed morality is not morality. Exactly. So when I went through what I went through, if I would have heeded to the accountability structure, which I myself decided to set up, which turned on me yeah. to devour me, I would have had friends yeah. in ministry and lost a whole church. Right. Yeah. I'd well, rather, in actuality, I'd rather kept, though, if I'd, you, you would have lost the church, then you couldn't have ever satisfied him, though. No, I, no, that, I, and I agree. They would have yeah. kept consuming yeah. me because right. of what I've done, and, and I would have lived with that. Right. But I had to make a decision. Either I'm going to remain in the purpose I said yes to, Bless or I'm going to heed to these guys and lose everything I Listen, ever worked for. Listen, you were brilliant for not resigning. I'm if, you, if, okay. Yeah. Can, can Every I do, person here, Pastor, Listen. I bless you for that. Yeah. You, I bless and, you and, for and that. Let, let, let me define it for you. Let me just break this out for you. Okay, we had two people, two people that were very close to Jesus that betrayed him. One was Judas Iscariot. He was so depressed about it, he returned the gold. He repented. He went to the guys and said, he's an innocent man. He's not wrong. They wouldn't believe him. And so he went out and killed himself in despair. Okay, Simon Peter also betrayed him, only he did it three different times. Verbally betrayed him, actively betrayed him in Jesus' worst time. But he kept going. Okay, because he kept going, St. Peter's Basilica is in the center of Rome today. We all respect St. Peter because his denial of Christ switched from being the defining moment of his life to being a paragraph in his life to being a few sentences, minor sentences in the Bible because he kept going. Uh Judas, though, built a memorial to his betrayal by killing himself. Now, what about your life? You've got some good things and bad stuff in your life. Every one of you have strengths and weaknesses. All right, so at your funeral, what are they going to talk about? All right, so if you let the negative processes that are going to go on in your life, because every one of you are hurt somehow, every one of you are disappointed by somebody, Every one of you have reason to be depressed. And all of you, your mother surely said a crossword to you sometimes. So you can blame her for everything. Okay. So, so every one of us, every one of us can do that if we want to. And we can build a memorial to the negative things in our life. Or we can keep going, which is what you did. See, you kept going. 
you kept going. And because you kept going, there was no memorial to the process that you went through on your day of sadness. Okay, because I resigned, I built a memorial. But I was tempted to die until the Holy Spirit showed me the four people I've just outlined for you. Judas, Peter, Nixon, and Clinton. Mm -hmm. Wow. And when the Holy Spirit showed me those four people in the desert, I stood up and I said, I'm not backing down for anybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't care, I don't care what they say, I don't care what they do, only Jesus is my Lord. And then, uh -huh. and then everybody, it came alive. Uh -huh. It came alive. Now follow this. I know I'm, I'm no, sorry. No, you... Okay. We expected it. it. Yeah, you did. <laughs> that's good. See, that's foreknowledge, but they didn't. Okay. See, see, but, but, but he, he, here's, here's the important part. Do all of you know who Michael Vick is? Uh -huh. Okay. Michael Vick could heal about two thirds of the way from his scandal and go into prison and all of that. He could heal about two thirds of the way, but the last third of his healing had to happen on the football field. Uh -huh. right. yes. Martha Stewart could heal about two thirds of a way from her lying and cheating Absolutely. and stealing and all of that and going to prison. But the last third of the way she needed to heal sell selling towels at Kmart. Uh -huh. <laughs> she needed to be doing what she was created to Man, do. See, yeah. see, um, David Letterman, he went through, he could heal to a certain point from his scandal that went on. Some of you don't even know about his scandal because he just kept going. All right. But he had a major scandal. All right. And he healed by keeping going, by doing what he's doing. So I see these guys that they say, well, I, I need to just set out a ministry until I get this all worked out. And I kick them in the butt. And I say, you get in that pulpit and you preach. And I said, I don't care if nobody comes. You preach. Right. And then you go pray in the spirit and read your Bible and you get on that platform and you preach again because the worst thing that ever happened to me was not that sin that I had to work through. It was stopping. Wow. When I stopped like my authority said to do right. and when I was arrested in my heart, I've never had legal charges against me or anything like that, but when I arrested my life like I was ordered to do by my chain of command, that's when every devil in hell was unleashed in my mind. Because a guy's got to do what he's created to do. Yes. If he's created to work at the plant, he's got to go back to the plant. Yes. If he's created to take care of children, he's got, she's got to get, rid, get to those children. See, you got to keep going. Everybody say keep going. Keep going. Pastor Ted, well, can I say, just add into that course. real quickly yeah. to finish the story about Peter? We have to remember the way Jesus responded to Peter. Peter said, I love you, Lord. I would never betray you. And Jesus said, you will betray me. But when you return to me, I mean, right then, right in that moment, he said, when you return to me, encourage your brothers. Yes. Fifty days later, Peter's the spokesperson, first spokesperson for the church, yeah, defending the gospel. Right. That's right. That's right. Well, we're going to pray. I'm going to interject the place for life at least, and I know some of these other churches. Pastor Ted, because you're keeping going in Miss Gale, by, by the time you get yes. to the end of your life, you know, your, your little scandal is going to be that. It's going to be a sentence. Yeah. We're going to exactly. agree. We're going to pray. Exactly. Because, because, you see, the hope that we give the world is not our perfection. It's not the slick advertisements. It's not our fancy suits and our nice cars. It's not our beautiful breast-implanted wives. Okay? That, 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 with all the hairspray and all the makeup. That is not what we offer. Have any of you seen Christian TV? So what are you laughing at me for? What are you doing? Are you not seeing what I'm seeing? Okay. I need a beautiful breast okay. implanted wife myself. Uh, <laughs> Listen, there are some things I can no, help you with, other things that. I can't. All right. <laughs> All right. We don't offer, what, us offering all that is appealing to people's worldliness. When we have to gold plate our, chair, our plastic chairs, 
And we, when we have to say we're influential when we're not, when we have to get the photo ops just like a politician, we've lost our power. Mm, that's good. But see, our message is not that we ain't poor no more. Mm -hmm. Our message is no matter what happens to us in life, no matter what the world throws at us, Jesus is faithful in the midst of us and he always has resurrection for that's you. Right. And that no matter what your parents were like, no matter what your economy's like, no matter what your education's like, there is a Sunday morning for you. Mm, yeah. And you can get up and he'll give you better ideas. Mm. He'll strengthen your awesome. skills. He'll make you innovative. Mm. Being spirit filled is not laying on the floor. Being spirit filled is operating That's with right. the ideas of That's the Holy Spirit, right. thinking That's with right. greater clarity. That's right. And so, and a spirit-filled church is a church growing in skills that produce goods and services for the community. Uh -huh. It makes the whole community better, not because everybody's bucking, but because everybody's producing. He just gave a good synopsis for my series, Spirit Led, Spirit Driven, if y'all want to buy it. And, <laughs> oh, gee whiz. And we just did this year. <laughs>